Welcome to the AIER's Authors Corners podcast. I'm your host, Ethan Yang, and today's guest is Marian Tupi. He's a senior fellow at the Cato Institute, as well as the editor of humanprogress.org. Marian, it's great to have you. Thank you very much for having me. So just to start off, you are the editor of humanprogress.org, which focuses a lot on how the world's getting better, um, how innovation's progressing, and how democracy is improving, human rights are improving. So what got you so interested in focusing on this topic of human progress? Um, humanism is part of the Enlightenment uh, to the extent that our modern society today is an outcome of the in, uh, Enlightenment values. Humanism is certainly a part of it. And what humanism means is that we don't just look at uh, our own well-being, the well-being in our own localities or countries. We care about the well-being of the human species, all 8 billion of us, and we take pride in the fact that uh, uh, the entirety of our species has been doing much better than before. So I think that part of liberalism, uh, as you and I understand it, liberalism in its original sense, not in its current American sense. Uh, humanism is very much a part of it. We care about the well-being of the globe. Uh, secondly, modernity, which is to say the world that started about 250 years ago, is really an outcome of greater liberalism, of greater freedom, uh, both in politics and in economics. Our institutions have changed from extractive institutions. Um, to more inclusive institutions. In other words, they became more liberal. And uh, today we refer to them as liberal democracy and some form of free market capitalism. Yes, there has never been a perfect democracy, perfect freedom, uh, perfect liberal democracy or perfect freedom. Yes, there has never been um, a complete uh, free market anywhere in the world. But Looking at the world over the last 200 years, we can say with a high degree of confidence that countries which have more liberal political and economic institutions have performed better than countries which have more restrictive or more controlled or more state oriented or more statist political and economic institutions. And so if, if indeed the current, in, if the world today is really an outcome of uh, liberalism, of greater freedom, then it is worth protecting. In other words, if people believe that the world is going to hell and nothing is getting better, then what are their incentives for keeping liberal democracy and free market capitalism going? Nothing. Uh, you know, that's why people on the far left and the far right um, uh, both are trying to paint the world as though it is a catastrophe, an Armageddon in the making, because that allows them to pursue their own um, uh, political goals. Whereas liberals like us will say, no, actually, the world is getting better and it is getting better because it is more free. And so it's not just that the world is improving, which is important, but also uh, we have to identify the reasons why the world is improving and defend those reasons. And the best way to defend those reasons is with facts. So if we can show to the world that it is actually in a much better place than, than most people assume, then hopefully they will have an incentive to support liberal democracy and free market capitalism. So that's actually quite fascinating that um, the improvements in the world and the metrics that you cite are fundamentally just a defense of how well uh, the, the free market system, the liberal de democratic system is working. So can you give us some examples of some metrics you've been studying? You, I know you cited a lot about um, improving incomes, improving life expectancies, lower uh, deaths at birth, so um, higher caloric counts. Uh, so can you give us, just take us through some of the facts and metrics that you've been using on your website? Well, the most important one is obviously life expectancy. If you are dead, then nothing else matters. And uh, uh, the reality is that in the richest countries in the world, not average, the richest countries in the world, life expectancy in 1900 was only 50 years. Uh, today, globally, it's something like, uh, I believe it's 72 years. 
uh, in the United States is 78 years. So just the lifespan, the, 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 the amount of time that you spent on Earth enjoying all those different things, um, your loved ones uh, traveling around the world and so on has expanded. And then of course, for most of uh, our time on Earth, um, you know, like 40% of babies would die before their first birthday. Today, it's a fraction of that. And that obviously contributes to the improved life expectancy. But even if we still had a very high uh, infant mortality, uh, life expectancies would be longer. Uh, one thing which I like to talk about that very few people miss, and that is that uh, throughout the existence of our species, our main concern, aside from not being murdered by other people, was to actually get enough food. We were really on the on the brink of starvation most of the time. Um, and, uh, you know, if you look at uh, the chimps, our closest cousins in the natural world, what, what are they, they like? You know, it's fighting and looking for food and chewing food and, and, and that sort of thing. And that's what we were like seven million years ago, you know, just searching for food, searching for mates and then uh, fighting with other primates. Um, today, in the poorest part of the world, which is sub-Saharan Africa, people have access to the equal amount of calories that the Portuguese did in the early 1960s, which is to say that all those um, predictions about um, you know, mass starvation because of population growth and all that thing didn't come true. Uh, two generations of people have been freaked out to death, scared to death by the oncoming starvation. Uh, in fact, the opposite has happened. We are producing more food um, and consequently, uh, intake of calories around the world is increasing, even up to the point where we are actually digesting too many calories and we are becoming fat. Even in sub-Saharan Africa, there are a lot of countries now where in the urban centers, obesity is becoming a problem. So access to food is another very important uh, aspect of human well-being. So let's get into um, what you just said earlier about how it's mostly the combination of liberal democracy and markets that allows uh, countries to prosper. And obviously, we've seen a lot of this happen in Western countries like America, uh, Europe, Japan, South Korea. But we've also seen um, kind of a juxtaposition. And I, I think I remember you're from the former Soviet Union, I think. Is that where you grew up? I, is that correct? Uh, so Soviet bloc. I, Soviet was born in I was born in Czechoslovakia. So yes, I was in the Soviet Empire, but I wasn't uh, in the actual Soviet Union. Okay, yeah, and then my family immigrated uh, from communist countries as well. So we have which that, one? Which one out of uh, interest? Cambodia and China. So, oh, okay. okay. Yeah. So tough, yeah, not the best deal. Tough, um, tough neighborhood. Yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely. Um, but we have, you know, we have this fascinating juxtaposition of these Western free market countries prospering and uh, countries like um, the, like the former Soviet Union and Cambodia and China not doing so well. So what do you? Why do you think that is? And what do you think that says about? Uh, the power of human progress in a liberal democracy? Well, both China and Cambodia have been doing much better in recent decades when they have abandoned uh, crazy ideas. I mean, uh, China and Cambodia, let's, let's just take those two as an example. I mean, Pol Pot uh, still holds the record in terms of mass murder. I think that in three or four years that he's been in power, he managed to kill between one third and one fourth of the Cambodian population. He expelled all the people from the cities. He shot uh, people wearing spectacles because they uh, reminded him of intellectuals. And he thought that everybody should be living in the, in the uh, rural areas in, and, and engage in agriculture. So that was insanity. In China, you had a different kind of insanity where, uh, where Mao uh, wanted to industrialize as quickly as possible. And that has resulted in tens of millions of deaths. But then over time, um, you know, those countries have changed their policies. Cambodia became more capitalistic and China famously in 1978 had abandoned communism and embraced, you know, a form of capitalism. Yes, it is still a very restrictive country politically, but economically it is much freer than it used to be. Um, so countries that have adopted some aspects of Western institutions and, and, and obviously greater freedom have prospered. India is another example. In 1991 or 1992, they had a major 
switch from the permit rush, um, you know, where, where the state was very heavily involved in the economy to something more akin to free market economy. And uh, as a consequence, India has also been booming. So um, these are just examples in the last few decades. But before then, um, you had extraordinary growth in Asia emanating from South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong, even in Latin America, you had the enormous rise of Chile. So wherever people are willing to abandon their preconceived notions, where they are willing to change course and embrace greater liberality, uh, they benefit. So let's talk about um, a recent trend in the US, which is the rise of nationalism. Um, specifically, uh, Peter Thiel is a guy I like to cite who um, believes in some sort of market capitalism, but lately he's been saying that, you know, innovation is dead in the U.S. We haven't had huge breakthroughs, and he specifically cites the Manhattan Project, like nuclear bombs and the moon landing as these examples of basically coming together collectively, usually through state power, uh, to do something really, you know, fantastic, like landing on the moon or something like that. Um, and so he's using that as just a claim that we haven't done anything like that. You know, innovation is slowing down. Um, therefore, we need to have more state planning and what, what have you. you. know, just basically rebelling against these liberal ideas. So I was just wondering uh, what you thought of that. Is he correct? And why would he be mistaken um, if it is liberal ideas and not state planning that actually drives innovation? So I don't know if Peter believes that the answer to America's problems is greater state involvement in innovation and in the economy or whether he believes that it is the state that is actually strangling the innovative process because of course American innovation could be suffering for uh, for different reasons. Uh, some people might say, oh, it's because the government is not spending enough money on uh, R&D. Um, others might say, well, hold on a second. It's because uh, the American economy is being uh, strangled by tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of different regulations and licenses and permits and what have you, that we don't have as much uh, innovation as we did in the past. Now. A similar thing is happening in the United Kingdom where uh, where Cummings, uh, what's his first name, um, uh, a man, Dominic Cummings has been pushing for the British version of DARPA because he believes that, uh, you know, it's it's the government, uh, it, 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 it's the government's involvement in innovation that can deliver great results. And who knows, maybe Dominic Cummings and uh, Peter Thiel have been um, have been heavily influenced by the uh, by, by the by the Chinese model, which is obviously not as hands off as um, as as ours is. But uh, the, the the trouble with China is that China so far has uh, been very good at mimicking uh, the Western success in in um, in uh, reproducing. Uh, the things that uh, Westerners have accomplished in decades past, building highways and the railways and airports and things like that. The big question is whether China can actually produce innovation, because for innovation you actually need a lot of freedom. And uh, because China doesn't have really political freedom or freedom of speech, um, it's very difficult to imagine that it will become a hub of innovation. It is, it is certainly a gr fast growing economy, but is it fast growing just because it is catching up with the West? Or is it because it's producing its own a set of ideas? And I suspect it is the former rather than the latter. Now, the other thing worth mentioning is this. It is perfectly true that when the government puts a lot of money behind something, it can occasionally succeed. Um, the Soviets uh, have built a wonderful uh, 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 space program. They had a lot of powerful nuclear weapons. They had excellent missiles and things like that, but their society was incredibly poor. In other words, they've succeeded in doing something, but then they failed in doing everything else. And governments can occasionally produce good results, but then there is the opportunity cost. In other words, how much of the money 
that the government has spent has actually resulted in something useful and how, how much of it was wasted. And in fact, economic history, especially since the Second World War, shows that a lot of governments which have tried to promote R&D and which have tried to generate economic growth through government subsidies have actually not done very well. This is not a new idea. Uh, Brazil had a lot of uh, substitution, a lot of import substitution. In other words, they were trying to make goods at home rather than, uh, rather than importing them from abroad, but that has failed. Uh, many other countries have tried to, uh, have tried to artificially um, uh, increase their growth rates uh, through government spending on R&D, and they too have failed. So the, I, I guess to summarize my answer is this. Uh, it is not that government fails in everything it touches, but that that uh, that it is very difficult for government bureaucrats to identify the one area that can produce uh, a lot of um, uh, a lot of return on investment. And more often than not, governments fail and they waste a lot of taxpayers' money in the process. Now, if private companies fail and private equity investors fail, it's their money, it's their problem. But when governments fail and, and waste a lot of resources, then of course they waste our resources and make all of us poorer. And uh, just to cycle back to your website, you know, I was just on it a few minutes ago and there's, you know, there's all sorts of wonderful news about new inventions, you know, like, for example, like we, there's new nasal sprays that can kill COVID-19, there's um, like blockchain technology. So the world is actually innovating and, and progressing, but we don't just, we just don't hear about it that much. So do you think there's something that maybe like the way the media operates when they like to basically uh, forecast doom and gloom and not talk about the, you know, the, the wonderful things that are happening every day? Well, if it bleeds, it leads. It's as simple as that. Psychologically, we are pre-programmed to focus on the dramatic and the traumatic. There is a reason why every newspaper or every news story leads with death and suffering and mass destruction is because that's what gets the eyeballs um, uh, and that's what gets the reptilian brain um, uh, concerned and worried and focused on the news item. Um, so that's part of it. And also good and bad things happen on different timelines. You know, good things take a long time to develop, uh, whereas bad things happen, happen immediately. Um, um, you know, um, so those are just some of the reasons uh, why it's so difficult to push the uh, more optimistic um, uh, vision uh, across is because our brains have developed to focus on the dangerous, right? If you were a perpetual optimist and uh, you were only looking on the bright side of life, you were probably weeded out of the gene pool a long time ago because the world was a much more dangerous place um, for the seven million years that we have split away from the chimps. Um, it was a life of extraordinary danger and tremendous suffering. And our brains have developed to focus on that rather than on the good. So just one last question to wrap all this up. And I guess this is the, the huge question of our day, which is, you know, a lot of young people believe the world's getting worse. They've lived through all sorts of tragedies. And so they think that we need to overthrow the system, right? We need socialism on the left, or we might need like some sort of um, right-wing nationalism from the right. So what can we do to uh, basically convince the, these young people, people like me, for example, um, that are living through this time period, but are looking at these extreme ideologies like socialism and they, they, you know, they're fed this narrative that the world's getting worse and we need to drastically change the system. What, what can we do? What kind of messaging is necessary uh, to let them all know that you know, the system is working? Human progress doesn't mean that everything is getting better for everyone, everywhere, at all times. That would not be human progress, as uh, Steven Pinker said, that would be a miracle. And so every generation is going to be facing problems. Uh, if you are 20-year-old or 25-year-old uh, young person in America, you have lived through 9-11 and the Iraq war and the Great uh, Recession and now the COVID pandemic. And it may seem to you like, uh, you know, 
it's been a very tough couple of decades. And in some ways it was, and in some ways it wasn't. Your parents were hiding under desks uh, or your grandparents were hiding under the desks during the 60s and the 70s, preparing for a nuclear catastrophe. Uh, that was also a world that was filled with danger. Your great grandparents uh, may have been fighting in the Second World War, dying by the millions, because you know that 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 was a problem too. Your own parents escaped from a country or from countries. Um, which had genocidal maniacs in charge. So it's not as though, you know, so I'm not denying that life can be quite difficult, but compared to what? Look at the past, look at human history and ask yourself, are you better off than a 17 or an 18 year old boy picking up a rifle and going to fight the Germans in the 1940s? Are you better off or worse off than uh, than a than a than a six year old child told to hide under a desk in preparation for an all out nuclear conflict between the two world superpowers. So we have to have a certain degree of of uh, perspective. Finally, what I would say is, um, it may seem as though uh, you know burning down the system may be a good idea because capitalism has its problems and liberal democracy have, has its problems. But remember that there is no guarantee that out of the ashes of the old society, something better will emerge. You know, there are many more ways in which things can go wrong than ways in which things can go right. It's the famous second law of thermodynamics. And what that means is that, yes, you could burn down the system and then stand amidst the ashes and realize that the path ahead of you is actually much more difficult than, than, than what you assumed. And so my suggestion to young people would be identify the problems, make sure that you identify the correct problems, and then try to change them incrementally. Human progress is incremental rather than burning down the system, expecting that somehow out of its ashes, something better will emerge because very often it does not. Thank you for what has been a very insightful and a very enlightening uh, interview on human progress. His what Marion, our guest is Marion Tupi. He's a senior fellow at the Cato Institute, as well as the editor of humanprogress.org. Um, for more content from AIER, check out our Facebook, Twitter, as well as our website at AIER.org. If you really liked what you heard and you want to continue supporting our mission, consider being a donor. All that information and more can be found at AIER.org. To our listeners, thank you and keep a lookout for our next guest.